You are listening to Grammy's Rocket Chair on RLM Radio. The girl of your dreams has got to be in some bar. Sorry, boys and girls, but this is X-rated. So if you're under 18... Get out, get out, get the point. Good. And now... Fendom. Y'all ready for this? We do it all night long. And now, your host, Grammy. Hey there, hi there, ho there, everybody. And guess what? It is a Freaker Friday. Woo-woo! Yay! And guess what? You are listening to Grammy's Rocket Chair here on RealLibertyMedia.com, channel 10. Or, you know, if you're used to the old, you know, it's channel 3, because I'm, I still, I catch myself. <laughs> it's like, no, you have your own channel now, because Grammy is the bomb. He is the bomb. Kaboom. He's the big kaboom, and he dropped the kaboom on you. I seen him kicking some bots earlier today, and it was like, booyah! You do it. Okay. First thing, big news. Freedoms Network will go dark on the 23rd of this month. That's next week, Wednesday. So be sure to, if you are a member over there, if you've got any blogs or any memes or anything like that that you wish to save, download them before next week, Wednesday. And if you wish to transfer them over to worldtruth.org, that would be just totally awesome. And speaking of worldtruth.org, hey, Aunt, Aunt Geo is over here and he's tweaking on a few things. That was that little bit, you know, you guys know I can't do a radio show without a few faux pas in the mix. <laughs> I just plain, if I ain't pushing buttons wrong, I'm doing something. But yeah, he had a video that auto started when I was broadcasting. And it's like, whoa, hey, wait a minute, Aretha's going. Dude, don't interrupt Aretha. Aretha's gone to the great beyond. She's up there hanging with people like uh, Ronnie James Dio and David Bowie and Prince and Elvis. You know, all kind of, and... and God, the list goes on. Roy Orbison and gee, Freddie Mercury and on and on and on. Damn, that's that would be a hell of a concert to watch, wouldn't it? Shit, I'd go watch it. I'd even pay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. And yeah, Aretha was free way of love. I love, I love Aretha anyway. That woman had some sass to her. By gosh and by golly. And uh, hell of a voice hell of a voice but over here on this uh, worldtruth.org yay thank you aunt for bringing it back aunt and bo diddy by the way we got mary b that's online as well as aunt and bo diddy and mickey y and barman is over here as well as circle o and rob works and mickey y are all the ones that are showing that they are logged in at the moment well, we've got quite a few people that have hopped on board so far so and that's right, Aunt just posted a comment to someone, there's no such thing as shadow banning here. Worldtruth.org does not ban, shadow ban. You know, if you wish to be censored, censor yourself. And if you wish to say something, deal with the repercussions of what you say. You know, so if someone's going to argue with you, that's their prerogative as well. You can either support your argument or you can walk away. Either one is acceptable, but don't expect us to go censoring for you because y'all are adults. You can censor yourself in polite public or in polite company. Although, <laughs> I seem to have a problem with that myself, but, you know, what the hell. Okay, over here on Twitter, thank you, Vinny and Barman. I also see Jabberwocky is over here playing around, having a good time. And, uh, yeah, there's a naked lady. Holy crap. Yoinks! Uh, let's see, who else is up here? Oh, Gary L. is over here as well. Hey, Gary L., and thank you, dear, for retweeting me. I appreciate it. I am up to 426 stalkers over here. I don't know what the hell I did, but... <laughs> I don't. <coughs> excuse me, I don't know if I should keep doing it or not. Oh, God, now it's telling me that people to follow. I could follow Mike Pence if I want to, or Laura Trump. I don't think so. How about Kellyanne Conway? Nope. 
Sorry. Not interested. Oh, well. Let me see if there's anything else worth a shite. Truth or UFO always comes up with some kind of way cool stuff. I love Truth or UFO. Oh, well. I'm going to go ahead and close Twitter because, yeah. I can't stand seeing that there telling me, yeah, you could you could follow Mike Pence. Really? There are lots of other things I would like to do than follow Mike Pence. One of them being probably sliding down a slipper slide into a, a big old vat of, of acid. I think that would be preferable to following Mike Pence around. Ew! Okay. Lisa B's over here on Fakie Book, and Lisa B says, you have to meet people where they are, and sometimes you have to leave them there. Yes, Lisa B, that is true. Okay, let's see, who else is over here? I know Gary L is over here as well, and uh, thank you ever so much, Gary, for sharing the, uh, letting people know, I'm on, I'm on. So, let's see. So, that's Fakie Book and World Truth and Twitter. Let's go check out Minds. I did not uh, remind over here on Minds because, you know, I'm really getting to the point where Minds is like, it's cool if you want to go there and troll. You want, you want well, scroll along, find some cool stuff, all that. But, you know, it doesn't seem like people interact with each other a whole hell of a lot over there. Or maybe I just don't see it. Maybe that's what it is. But I prefer... Um, some place where people interact at least a little bit. Legalize hemp. Yay! Oh, I do like that one. Ban plastic explosives. Um, oh, only use explosives that are biodegradable. Really? What the hell, woman? <laughs> oh, no, it's a guy. Excuse me. Never mind. Apparently in San Francisco, plastic explosives get you locked up. San Fran don't stand for violence toward the environment. So if you want to blow up cars, use paper explosives. Yeah, sure, the blast won't kill as many people, but that's the price you have to pay to save the planet. We wouldn't need paper explosives if the government hadn't outlawed hemp, because hemp explosives are cheaper and much more efficient killers. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Josh Wiz. Wits. That is kind of cute. Thank you. And I do like this little meme that was over here from Trafficker of Information. It says false flags, and it's got a little teacher that's telling you just exactly what a false flag is. False flags are a horrific staged event blamed on a political enemy and used as a pretense, stop refreshing you god dang thing, as a pretext to start a war or enact draconian laws in the name of... National security. You know, there's so much stuff that goes on in the name of or in the under the color of, you know, or this like religiosity crap that's going on. Wee. And the damn priests. Well, it's in the name of Jesus, I pray. And you better just, yeah, just do it because I'm a holy person. See, I walk around in a dress all day. You know what, guys? I walk around in a dress sometimes, too, but I don't expect people to bend over and do all kind of kinky shit. Weirdos. They need to get over themselves. And they also need to suffer the repercussions of, of what they are doing to others as well. My personal opinion. Hi, Ethan Indigo. Let's see what's going on. I'm just checking real fast, and then I'm going to move along. So, I've been to, one, two, three, 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 I gotta go check out Effin's site, because Effin is still up. And thank you, Grimner, for letting everybody know that I am on right now. Truly appreciate it, hon. And he did do a little uh, notice for everyone that, um, move your stuff over to worldtruth.org. Dot org need to remember that part because there's a couple other world truths out there and well i'm not going to go there <clears throat> naughty naughty nasty memories so uh estrella is over here as i saw bob renner was over here for a while as well as kd troxel and late in too so hey hi guys how you doing ladies and gents and now to the RLM, which is where you need to be if you want to give me static, in the real libertymedia.com chat. Come on over <clears throat> and, you know, pick a nickname, join the chat, 
give me some shit. No big deal. I will give it back to you. Probably some of the people in the chat will give you some crap too. And yeah, it's okay. Because you can give it back to them as well. Ooh, Grimmy is going to be smiting people. Yay! Because Grimmy is the RLM god, don't you know? As we will soon find out, and I see in the chat, Barman right up top, the most splendiferous bot in the whole wide world, closely followed by Grimner, the RLM god. The lovely Moose Girl is also here, and guess what? Grimmy and Moose Girl are going to be on later this evening for the Freaker's Ball, so... And I have a funny feeling they're going to have a tribute to the lovely Aretha Franklin. And I know there's an awful lot of people out there that go, really, have you seen her? And it's like, dude, seriously, have you seen some of her older pictures? She was a va va -voom. let me tell you. And that woman had a hell of a voice. Oh, I got people texting me, too. In any case, <clears throat> got myself all choked up there. Excuse me, by the way, um, yeah, I was out pulling weeds and mowing today, so if I get to hacking and wheezing and coughing and sneezing, yeah, pollen is in the air. You know, I had I read something somewhere that pollen is like the plant's sperm, and so while I was outside working in the yard and mowing and all that fun stuff, I was being plant sperminated. <laughs> That'll mess with your head. Messed with mine when I just thought of it. So, um, oop, ah, ee, oop, going hiding. Oh, you're going hiding in my blankie house? Don't be messed with, oh, no moose tonight? Oh, okay, thanks, Grimmy. So, it'll be balls to the wall tonight. Moosey apparently has a life. <laughs> Although, I will be gone tomorrow well actually most of the weekend because i'm going to be going to help my mother she has things that need to be done and it's like yes yeah, seeing as how i'm the eldest daughter i get volunteered a lot and it is kind of fun going helping mom go through shit and go really seriously mom you still have this my children are doing that to me already too so <laughs> it's kind of fun to give it back to my mom pass it on up the line Okay, I also see the lovely Kate is here. Hi, Kate. How you doing? Down in Florida. I help, hope the weather is just absolutely tranquil for you. Anti is here. Hey there, dude. As well as Asmo. Chalsa Denis is also logged in. And Cycles. <laughs> you have any plant jizz? I've been sperminated by the plants. And it makes me sneeze and wheeze. Oh, well. Hmm. Wow. I wonder if... No, don't go there. <laughs> yes, Rob. She got a life again. It's like, what the hell, woman? Oh, well. Back to saying, hey, cycles! Cycles. I sent cycles a bunch of pictures of my garden earlier today while I was out watering because I'd been promising to send her pictures for quite some time. And I just finally got around to it. I had I was so depressed because I only out of all of my my th thunderstorms and deluges and hail breaking loose all over the place, you know I had two cucumber plants that survived. Those things are beasts. Did I drop? I hope I didn't drop. Oh, I did. Let me, let me fix it. I'm still on Spreaker, but let me see. See if I can get connected again. Come on, connect to the stream, connecting the stream. I don't know what's going on, Grimmy, but I'm having a hell of a time connecting to the stream. And apparently, um, let me see here. Nope. My internet is being really shit tonight. Um, let me see. Let's see. I don't know why it's dropping, though. Unless it's my... Because I don't have... Yeah, I don't have real good internet tonight. So I'm not sure what the hell's going on. 
Ah, uh, da Let me see if let me close this and see if that doesn't make a difference. It's not. I'm still having trouble connecting to the stream. Damn it! Disconnect error one zero zero six zero. So, um. Oh, Shoutcast is down. Okay. Thanks, Graham. Well, that makes it a little bit easier. I will open up my my Vivaldi again then, because, yeah, I need my links. I need links here. Links, please. Good thing I got a backup plan with Spreaker, huh? Although you to hear me going, what the, what the, I didn't do it. <laughs> Honest, I didn't push a button that time. Okay, come on, Vivaldi. Wakey, wakey. There you go. Good job. Good job, you overachiever, you. Make sure my world truth opens up. Yay. <coughs> Excuse me. So, okay. Do you wish me to to test it every once in a while, Grim? I can, if you wish. But, oh, mail suspenders? What? What? Somebody just... Oh, good God. Oh, good God. They're doing mail sus... Uh, oh. Oh, Lord. To keep... Oh, God. No. Oh, I I could see having suspenders to hold your pants up, but Jesus, God Almighty, not garters. Oh, Shoutcast is back. Okay, we will do that. Thanks, Grim. We'll try it again. Let me in, let me in, little pig, little pig, let me in. Come on, connect to the stream. Streamer is connecting to server. It's still being a poo-poo head. Come on. Let me in. I'll bet you guys love this. This is like a coward co-sell, play-by-play. I still got the error, Grim. So, I will try it again here in just a couple minutes. If you're listening on Spreaker. Um, oh, cool. I'm glad it is, Frumpy. Thank you. So... I will try one more time to see if I can get connected through the shoutcast thing. And if I can't, then I'm just going to say, Nyink! but it's a, it's a different error than what I'm used to having. So I don't know. And if they made it to where I have to redo some settings or some such stuff, they're just going to have to wait. That's all there is to it. It's not, it's not connecting. Not through shoutcast. So, Okay. Yay, Vinny's on Spreaker now. Yay, Vinny! And yes, look, webcom dot, oh yeah, webcom radio is still up. Yay, JJ's. Yay for you. Let me see. No, it's still, apparently I got something wrong with my flow because it's still connecting to the stream. Good God, I got to refresh my freaking Facebook because I can't stand looking at the guy with the garters. Oi. Okay, um, back to saying hey. So, over here in the RLM, where was I at? Cycles, Chloe, Chloe, Colfax 101, Cyborg Noodle, who is a bot, but maybe you will be touched by his noodly goodness. I also see Chloe with the slash instead of the L, and Dakota. Hi there, Echelon. How are you doing, sweetheart? And Frumpy and Gooberzilla. And I'm here, <coughs> kind of, sort of, maybe, almost. Yeah, I, B, D, C, as well as I, B, Don, C, Java, 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 Dr. 2 is in the house. And looky there, there's that JJ's feller from over there on webcom.co.uk. Yay, JJ's, you the man. Uh, let's see. Juana Taco is here, as well as Kozu and Meister Brower. And looky there, Rob Works is passing around the bubbler again. Dude, you're so bubbly. Got such a bubbly personality. Puff, puff, pass. Maybe that's why I'm choked up. Never know. Hi, Meister Brower. Woody. Woody. 
I'm going to turn my speakers down on my headphone because, wow, I'm starting to get some serious as rattling in my brains. All two of them. <laughs> moy, 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 moy is here as well as Pox Box and Poxified and Poxophone and Poxy Home. Lots of Pox in the box today or in the chat, if you will. Pop a Bon Sauce is also here as well as the lovely rain in Spain flows mainly in the plain. Hi, RLM Fluky, the Vanna White of the RLM channel. And Rob Works, who is the ultimate bubbleinator because he bubbles all the time he's always firing up them bubblers and thank god he's firing up that bubbler as opposed to the other bubbles that are ever so effervescent and sometimes don't smell real good <laughs> you know what a twerp is as someone that farts in the bathtub and bites the bubbles i'll bet you didn't know that did you and you could have gone your whole life without hearing it too i'm sure okay i told you anyway sock puppet hi sock um, oh, I'm coming through on Shoutcast again. Yay! Sweet! Yeah, it's about damn time. Got dandruff, some of it itches. Okay, let's see. Sock Puppet. Skittles! The X, the f bominator. We got a bunch of na uh, naders in here. Nader, nader, nader. Uh, no, that's Nanu Nanu, right? Trust no one is in the house, as well as Vinny! Vinny, were you on this afternoon? I was out on my riding mower. Seriously. But I got all my mowing done. All of it. All of it. Because I'm going to be gone over the weekend. Um, um, oh. Shoutcast is having... Uh, I wonder if it's the NSA. Mm, I wonder. Oh, well. Let's see. Trust on Vinny. Phantom! That's rounding out the crew. Phantom, the one who did my wonderful intro where he promises X-rated and all that other fun stuff. And Well, sometimes I do things to your mind that you think it probably should be X-rated. So, mm. um, how you sock? How you doing? Hope you're doing awesome. Okay. Uh, let me see. Where in the hell am I at? What the hell am I doing? I don't know, and that's the fun part. I never know what I'm doing. Huh. <sighs> well, actually, sometimes I do, but yeah, y'all ain't playing along when I'm doing that. <laughs> okay, so, let's see, where do I want to go first? So, da 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 da. Yeah, let's go with this one, because I saw this one in my pocket, and I thought, what? What? It's from the phillymag.com. And those millennials, by golly, they're getting, <clears throat> excuse me, they're getting blamed for everything. Everything. Did you know that millennials killed mayonnaise? What the hell? What the hell? Apparently, with the in inexorable rise of identity condiments, it has led to hard times for most American or the most American of foodstuffs. And that's a shame. See, I still use mayonnaise when I'm making salads and sandwiches. And I use mayonnaise for, I actually use it for baking as well. So, you know, I use it for all kind of stuff. And I don't need all that identity shit unless it's like coconut oil. I use a lot of coconut oil too. <clears throat> so... I write this in the dead of summer, always a bittersweet season. Why is it that we got summers off from school for all those years, but don't get summers off from work? I don't know. That doesn't make sense. That's just not right. I mean, school is supposed to be prepping you for work anyway, so why don't they truly prep you for work and you get to have the summer off? Sounds like a plan to me. Go out and play, go to the swimming pool, hang out, just be stupid. Works for me. <laughs> oh well. <clears throat> but doubly depressing these days when I find myself suffering from picnic panic. <gasps> Egad. The hot, languid weather brings with it a series of outdoor family events for which, as the tribal elder, I'm charged with providing provisions. Lately, though, I've had to I've had my feet cut out from under me for years. Nay, decades, 
my contributions to the Hingston clans Memorial Day and Fourth of July and Labor Day gatherings were no-brainers. I made what my mother once made. She was such a good cook that when she died prematurely, my husband and I typed up and photocopied, quaint, I know, but a booklet of her recipes. And you know what? I still have my recipes written down. I know my children do the online shit, but if I find a recipe that I really like online, I print it off. Because I don't trust the internet. I know. Call me crazy. It's my tinfoil hat. Sometimes it gets a little bit snug around the edges. But, you know, if it if it should all go to shit and I don't have that recipe that I saw last week that I really wanted to try, I'm SOL. So, if I like a recipe or it looks very tasty, I print it off. I'm a radical like that. I'm killing trees. <laughs> Whatever. In any case, they pr she printed out a booklet of her mother's recipes. Tried and true favorites on which she built her formidable culinary reputation. Now, when the holidays rolled around again, I simply recreated one of her delicious dishes and toted it along. Well, along about a decade ago, though, I began to notice I was toting home as much of my offerings as I'd concocted. My contributions were being overlooked or shunned. You know, the last time I went to a big gathering, I made a great big thing of spaghetti salad. You use, um, I used yellow bell peppers and red bell peppers and orange bell peppers and celery and carrots. And what else did I put in there? Tomatoes. And then uh, had cooked up my spaghetti and then covered it all with Italian dressing oh man that stuff is the bomb and it's like three people ate from it so I spent the next two weeks <laughs> finishing it off <laughs> which is okay because I really enjoy it but it was like wow hmm what the hell y'all it's slurpy food everybody loves slurpy food oh well so Back to this. So why should this be? Mom's extraordinary potato salad. Oh, that does not. That does not ever get sent home. <clears throat> Fragrant with dill. Spiced with celery seed. It won untouched on the picnic table. Oh my God. He got the humanities. You didn't eat the potato salad? What's the world coming to? So did her macaroni salad. And her chicken salad. And her deviled eggs. Oh my God. The world is coming to an end. People did not consume all the deviled eggs. That's always the first thing that goes around my family gatherings. So, when I carted home a good three pounds of painstakingly prepared Waldorf salad, all that peeling and coring and slicing, I was forced to face facts. The family's tastes had changed. Or rather, our family had changed. Oldsters were dying off. And young'uns taking our places in the paper plate line were different somehow. Yes, they are different somehow. But you know what? My grandkids still like my Waldorf salad. That is if her Waldorf salad is like the Waldorf salad that I make. My grandkids really like it. Of course, they like apples. So, so I racked my brain for the source of this generational disconnect. And then, one holiday weekend... While surveying the condiments set out at a family burger bash, I found it. On offer were four different kinds of mustard, three ketchups, one made from, I kid you not, bananas. Ew! Ew! Seven sorts of salsa. Okay, I like salsa. Kimchi, wasabi, relishes of every ilk and hue. Now, I like wasabi too. I've never had kimchi. Um, I did try zucchini relish though. My cow or my uh, my farmer friend, his aunt sent home some some zucchini relish. Oh, M G, that stuff is wonderful. I need to get the recipe from her. Written down, by the way. So, back to this. So, what was missing though, was the common foundation of all of Mom's picnic foods, mayonnaise. So while I wasn't watching, Mayo's day had come and gone. It's too basic for contemporary tastes. 
pale and insipid and not nearly exotic enough for our era of globalization, good old Mayo has become the Taylor Swift of condiments. <laughs> I just said Miley Cyrus, of, but no, I still like mayonnaise. So, my mom was the daughter of Lithuanian immigrants, born in an era which huddled masses clamored ashore at Ellis Island, and their pockets stuffed with kielbasa and chorizo and... Braunschweiger and Makanek. Wow. And Lapchalong. That sounds like something disgusting that you do in a dark room and there's music playing in the background. <laughs> and were processed in the Great American Assimilation Grinder, emerging to dine happily ever after at Hatfield Hot Dogs and Potato Salad. Her entire life, she worried about sticking out, not fitting in. She was self-conscious that her parents spoke with accents. She worked like a tiger to haul herself out of the South Philly via Girls High and Temple, where she met my dad, and whose American heritage stretched a few decades further back, and whose people came from the British Isles. So... Which is, yeah, definitely where there's an awful lot of bland food there. So, America in the 1950s was full of strivers like mom, desperate to forget family legacies of latkes and boxties and bromkabora and whatever, whatever the hell that is, and pouring through the pages of Family Circle and Good Housekeeping and Woman's Day for Stars and Stripes recipes that revved up their new found home and you know what i still like looking through good housekeeping and getting those recipes but it's been a while since i've done that hmm so they wanted all their strangeness to dissolve into a civil sizzling pot of crisco that crisped their french not french fries from fries or grated it's profoundly un or granted it's profoundly unfortunate in what escalant terms whatever the hell that is that the nation's newcomers fixated on foods from england and ireland and scotland but women's magazines back then were mostly exclusively edited by wasps you mean them bastards with wings huh i had one of those strafing me while i was on the mower so, besides, the impetus seemed righteous, and in a world torn asunder by the Great Depression, the Holocaust, and two world wars, our citizenry needed to come together, be united, rally behind a collective vision, what it meant to be an American. You lived in a single-family house. You drove a station wagon, you wore bowling shirts and blue jeans, and you slathered mayonnaise on everything from BLTs to burgers to pastrami on rye. And how do you hold the mayo, or how do you think hold the mayo became a saying? Now, there was always mayo, and if you were the kind of deviant who didn't want it, he had to say so out loud, which, you know, everybody, it was like an E.F. Hutton kind of thing. Hold the mayo. What? What? So apparently her son, Jake, who's 25, eats mayo. He's a practical young man who works in computers and adores macaroni salad. He's a good son. And she also has a daughter. And she was a woman's and gender study major in college. Naturally, she loathes mayonnaise. Really? And she's not alone. Ask the young people you know their opinion of mayo, and you'll be shocked by the depths of their emotion. Oh, there's the occasional outlier like Jake, but for the most part, today's youth would sooner get their news from an actual newspaper than ingest mayonnaise. Oh my God, there's something wrong with these children. Now, the origins of this contentious con condiment are a hotbed of debate. It is a name derived from the city of Mehan on the Balearic island of Menorca, where the Duke de... Yeah. 
Richelieu's chef, whatever the high chef, was unable to find cream for a sauce to celebrate his lordship's successful siege during the Seven Years' War. Substituted emulsion of eggs and oil. Or is it a bastardi bastardization of bayonets from the Gaelic town renowned for its tasty hams? So, whatever, either way, the dressing had crossed the Atlantic by 1838, and when Chichi Manhattan restaurants Delmonico's offered both lobster and chicken mayonnaise on its menu, ta da, it had made the big time. So, mayo spread <laughs> to the more common man after the invention of the mechanical bread slicer. Just in time for sandwiches, which came from the Earl of Sandwich. To be tucked inside brown bags and unwrapped in lunchrooms of the nation's factories, mayonnaise at this point was still mostly homemade, whisked up by wives as needed. But the culinary horizon was shifting. In 1912, the German immigrant owner of the Upper West Side Deli, Richard Hellman, began to sell mayonnaise packed in jars decorated with three blue ribbons. That's according to the culinary historian Andrew Smith. These jars differed from those of Hellman's condiment competitors in one vital way. They had wide mouths enabling customers to get big-ass spoons inside. So, sales were so successful that two years later, Hellman sold his deli to open the first in an ever-growing series of manufacturing facilities devoted to Hellman's real blue ribbon mayonnaise. And at one point, when Hellman and his wife were in Europe to research product distribution, travel agents urged them to sail back to the U.S. on a shiny new ship, the Titanic. That was making its maiden voyage. Well, they took a smaller ship instead, and thank God, because Hellman's was the only mayonnaise my mayo-doting dad ever ate. So... More than a hundred years after its creation, Hellman still sells more than half the mayonnaise in the nation. Booyah! And it is the standard by which others are judged. So, um, apparently there's a Laveau who was in, he was a, da -da -da, he wrote in Slate a few years back, that uh, and when he was interviewed by a professional taster he says that he considers Hellman's a member of an exclusive group of products that are so refined and sophisticated that it's hard for the average palate to break them down into their component flavors you don't taste egg in Hellman's the taster or the taster explained and you don't taste oil or vinegar all the flavors blend together they're balanced nothing sticks out Everything is appropriate, which is why I prefer Hellman's mayonnaise as well. But I do need to learn to make my own, just in case. So, one of the reasons for mayonnaise early popularity, according to the public health historian David Merritt Johns, was that it served to disguise flaws in the ingredients it coated. You know, potatoes past their due date, or flabby cabbage, or tuna that was less than pristine. Long, young people like my daughter somehow seem to have extrapolated this masking function from condiment to culture. For them, mayo quite literally whitewashed America's immigrants into eating dull food. Ooh, and it's white. Egad, it's white. It must be racist. So... And newer generations are refusing to meekly fall in line with culinary heritage that never was theirs. So instead, they're gollering up um, kefir and ajvar and chimichurri and, and good... What, what? Are you making this shit up, woman? I've never heard of some of that shit. So, they are also shunning their parents' preferred restaurants. Applebee's, Ruby Tuesdays, TJI Fridays, 
to seek out more authentic fare. You know, I don't really give a shit about Applebee's. Last time I ate at Applebee's, it did not sit well with me and haven't been back. And that's been years ago. I do like TGI Fridays. I've only been to Ruby Tuesdays once. Nah, eh, wasn't really all that. Yeah. Now, old school eateries in turn are divesting in their search for new or diversifying in their search for new customers. Just this year, Red Lobster rolled out a waffles and lobster option. Nasty. And Red Robin launched a vegan burger. Yummy. And you don't put mayo on a vegan burger. McDonald's has debuted a signature whatever burger. And joining KFC, Wendy's, and Subway in signing on to a sizzling Thai sauce moment in the sun. Mm. And you don't see Hai Fung Foods start a schmear campaign against the cultural appropriation of that. No, you don't. So, what young people really, really love to hate on is mayonnaise. Probably because it's white. Probably. I like mayo. I always have liked mayo. So back in 2013, BuzzFeed ran an article titled 24 Reasons Mayonnaise is the Devil's Condiment. Really? The Slime of Satan. Yeah. Just three years later, BuzzFeed ran another piece. 23 things you'll, um, you'll only understand if you fucking hate mayo. Well, I don't, so I apparently will never understand those things. And it was by a different author. And there was no overlap. Drew uh, Maggery penned the piece for Bon Appetit with the headline, Big Mayo Will Destroy Us All. And a movie called The Mayo Conspiracy won the best comedy feature in 2015, World's Independent Film Festival. And it concerns a gradual uncovering by a journalist of a mayonnaise cartel that plans to take over the world. Well, hmm... Okay, so clearly there's something more to this river of resentment than a minuscule mixture of eggs and oil. And it's obvious to me that this condiment divide can be traced to young folks' rejection of what they sneeringly consider a boring white food. So, do you think me... um, Let's see, do you think 23andMe and MyHeritage and all those other DNA testing companies are flourishing because people want to find out their ancestors came from Aberdeen? Hell no! They want to be from Marrakesh or Manchuria or Malawi. And it's the same with condiments. I'm not part of the elderly Mayo masses. I'm Turkey and Swiss on China. Uh, Chibata and whatever and chipotle spread and a little basil pesto and that's who I am damn it my sandwich myself really you have to identify with your freaking condiments oh my lord now there are other theories regarding mass generational mayonnaise rejection because some experts say that the dislike springs from the fact that mayo jiggles. Well, so does jello, but you don't see anybody. Oh, wait, no, that's in the next. <laughs> I should just read. Apparently, she said, my mom made a dynamite um, black cherry jello, walnuts, olives, canned cherries, and small balls of cream cheese. That sounds gross, actually. You don't put olives in with that. Yuck. And others posit that mayonnaise is reminiscent of bodily fluids and therefore, as Penn psychology professor Robin Rosen has suggested, it's just too disgusting to ingest. Well, honey, what have you been looking at that you think mayonnaise... Never mind, just move along. (laughs) Oh, and then Kendra Pierre-Louise got down to the re-mayo in popular science when she said... It's a vicious, or or its vicious quality is the sort of thickness that you'll get from fluid oozing out of a rotted carcass. As anyone has ever poked a rotted squirrel with a stick can attest. I have never done that, and thank you for that graphic description, because now I definitely won't. Ooh, 
And the creamy appearance of mayonnaise isn't dissimilar to what would emerge from, say, a popped zit. Oh, wow. You really don't like mayo, do you? Kendra Pierre-Louise. Wow. Of course, it's all bullshit. That attitude comes from you, from young people, who willingly slurp down eight gazillion kinds of yogurt, not to mention raw fish and pork belly and yo detergent pods. So don't talk to me about mayonnaise. Besides the fact that you drink all them damn monster drinks and that that stuff's just nastiness. It is so bad for you. At least mayo is oil and vinegar and eggs. Seriously. Three ingredients. Go read the label of a monster drink sometime. Or a Tide Pod. Ugh. Apparently the only reason for this raging mayophobia is the generation's gut level renouncement of the greatest generation's condiment of choice. Well, if it comforts you to think that way, honey, but you know, I know a lot of people that don't like mayo. I prefer I personally do. So here's the thing. The all-American condiment didn't have to be mayonnaise. It could have been ketchup or mustard. Hell, it could have been horseradish, but it wasn't. It's not mayo's fault that it's been so successful, that it glimpsed a condiment breach and jiggled right on through. As Boston chef Scott Jones told some magazine, I'm not trying to butcher that, the magic that sets mayonnaise above Coke and Heinz is that mayo is the perfect flavor carrier. It just makes everything better. So if you need proof, do other condiments have pale imitators like Miracle Whip and Just Mayo and Veginase and yeah, I don't think so. So, we're all capable of growth, you know. And I add a little fish sauce to my stir fries these days. And I have a bottle of salsa in my fridge. And I thought peop young people today were supposed to be all about inclusion, about kindness and compassion, and making other people feel welcome. So how about you include a little mayo in your picnic fare? Because mayo has been the building block for thousands of different tweaks in the rainbow of cultures. You know, like Russian dressing and rumelade and comeback sauce and fry sauce and kewpie and salsa rosada and mayo chup. So just because something is old and white doesn't mean it's obsolete. Look at Shakespeare. Not me. <laughs> But then again, it may be too late to staunch the mayo hate because, you know, America already may be too far gone. Which, yeah. So, while I was researching this article, yeah, like you think I just pulled all this stuff out of thin air, I came across some news that for one brief shining moment filled me with hope. Apparently, an organization known as the Association for Dressings and Sauces, or ADS, took a poll that revealed something amazing. Millennials love mayo, the headline screamed. And according to ads, older millennials, those from 25 to 34, are the most frequent purchasers of mom's preferred condiment. Ahead of the next most frequent, which would happen to be my demographic boomers, um, age 50 to 65, which, hey, that's also mine. Um, and granted, we boomers are all anxious to avoid the mayo clinic, but could a new generation really be primed and ready to take up Richard Hellman's torch? Nope. Tucked well down in the report on the survey was this little nugget, courtesy of ADS Executive Director Janine Milowski. We were founded as a Mayonnaise Products Manufacturers Association. <clears throat> and had to change your name to stay relevant. So, okay, Association for Dressings and Sauces. I see how it is. Now, the saddest part is, my mom's macaroni salad is banging. You kids are only cheating yourself by rejecting it. Besides, I've got news. That aioli you're so fond of, I hate to break it to you, but that's just mayonnaise. So... 
That was a rather long one. I wasn't really prepared for it to be quite that long, but that really, it's, no. What? Don't be doing this shit. Frickin' thing had a little pop-up lock me. Don't you be locking my ass out. Um, oh, I gotta agree with Anti. Not respecting somebody ain't the same as disrespecting. Because, you know, being just, being disrespectful is, when you do not respect someone, you don't necessarily come right out and behave in a disrespectful manner. You just kind of, I'm just going to be digging that hole deeper and deeper. So, I don't know, did it? No, I'm still going. I'm s- I show it's still going, Rob. So, uh, let me put this over on World Truth real fast. I personally like mayo. I use it for a lot of things. Um, and seriously, people that don't do, you know, like um, deviled eggs and potato salad. What the hell's wrong with you people? Jeez. Those are like staples. Although, yeah, I know some people, and that's fine. They leave more for me. That's okay. Okay, get that shared over here on World Truth. This is so fun. I get to share things on World Truth again. I know it's just a little thing, but it, it it's a big thing too. So, now that I've done that, let's see. Since I'm on the food kick already anyway, let's come on over here to Bloomberg.com because I saw this one and I get nine more free articles before I have to subscribe to Bloomberg. So I'm eking them out. And this one, the headline got me. Tyson isn't chicken. The hell is it then? First mayonnaise goes under the axe and now you tell me this what the hell the world's going to hell in a great big hand basket and that doesn't mean we're going on a picnic neither apparently <clears throat> virtually all of the company's revenue comes from animal slaughter and processing but now its new ceo is pouring money into animal free alternatives yummy So, now, that is a beautiful belly, Tom Hayes says, running his hand along a plastic-wrapped contours of the slab of pork about the size and shape of the Gutenberg Bible. It's lying on a stainless steel table in a test kitchen at the Discovery Center, a laboratory for product innovation at Tyson Foods, Inc. in Springdale, Arkansas. Now, Hayes who served as chief executive officer since December of 2016, lifts and rotates the block of meat, examining the cut with loving attention. Ever seen a pork belly, Liz? He asks his director of executive communications, Liz Coppy. She's touring the research and development center for the first time, and she had not. I think you should hold the pork belly, Hayes says, his tone half-joking, half-reverent. And he carries the slab with outstretched arms and lays it in Coffee's hands, conducting what seems to be a spontaneous benediction. Now, Tyson produces one of every five pounds of meat consumed in the U.S. Hayes and his 122,000 employees annually process and sell 15 billion with a B worth of beef, 11 billion with a B of chicken, and 5 billion with a B of pork. And they also formulate, package, and sell 8 billion in prepared foods under the original roster or under the brand roster that includes Hillshire Farms, Jimmy Dean, Ballpark Franks, Original Philly Cheesesteak, and Adele's Sausage. Now, half of the products are distributed by retail grocers, but most of the rest go to Mickey D's, Burger King, Wendy's, KFC, and other food service outlets. So Hayes, who's 53, is an upbeat, shoulder-punching, call-me-Tom kind of leader. You know, a man of the people. 
as more than one member of his team describes him. And all of that has emboldened and perhaps insulated the CEO who's positioned himself as a forward-thinking renegade in an industry many consider ethically unsound, environmentally catastrophic, and mired in old world thinking. Now since Hayes started, he trumpeted the promise of sustainable proteins and cleaner foods in the media, you know, like Squawk on the Street and Mad Money, and at conferences, and in the Twitter sphere. He's made practice statements such as, I took this job to help revolutionize the global food system and pledged to raise the world's expectations for the good we can do through food. How much of that shit's GMO? How many of those critters that you do are fed GMO? Mm, I'm thinking that's edging rock close to 100%. <laughs> So, the language sounds awfully suspicious coming from a man whose company produ or processes about 1.8 billion animals per year. I've watched documentaries on, uh, yeah, Tyson, and they're not pretty. Now, Tyson operates dozens of mass-scale slaughterhouses and has been criticized for water and air pollution, animal cruelty, and labor violations. It's also responsible for tens of millions of metric tons of greenhouse gas emission a year. That's if you consider CO2 a greenhouse gas. Or possibly you're talking about methane, which comes from farts. Not just animals, but from people too. So, oh, and that's on the par with the whole of Ireland. You know what? I'll bet you if you put all of, Sw of Tyson's facilities together, it would probably cover an area the size of Ireland. How about let's put things in perspective here. So, to call it a sustainable or do-gooder company would be absurd, says Matthew Prescott, who is Senior Director of Food and Agriculture for the Humane Society of the U.S., which the Humane Society has got an awful lot of skeletons in their closet and hickeys on their backside as well. Just saying. Yet Hayes, whose square-jawed face and brilliantine hair really is that a word uh, should I I better not give him shit because I make reports all the time they gave him the look or that hair gave him the look of the 50s marketing boss and he insists it's precisely because of Tyson's scope that he has the potential to make a difference we're so big that the industry can't change if we don't lead oh oh so, in his first few months at the helm, Hayes replaced six of ten division heads, many with hires from outside the meat industry. He also created two roles, Chief Technology Officer and Chief Sustainability Officer. Hayes and his team rolled out new sustainability goals in rapid succession. And Tyson would remove antibiotics from all Tyson-branded chicken products in 2017, Booyah. Props for that. It would slash its greenhouse gas emissions 30% by 2030, not only internally, but also throughout its supply chain. It would continue to improve e um, efficiency at its plants, expand organic product offerings, and practice sustainable land management on 2 million acres of corn grown for animal feed. Yeah, stop using the GMO corn. Hayes pledged to enhance employee welfare, improve animal treatment, and strengthen rubics that protect the Tyson-raised animals' right to a life that's worth living. Yeah, get them out of those big-ass facilities where they don't see the light of day and they're just stepping all over each other. That would be a... You, you'd be surprised. The food would actually be tastier if you got them out of those conditions. And possibly that's why people are falling for all of this false flag shit. Because if any of you have watched Eureka and the little imitation chicken thing and how well that went off. Yeah, but if you stop and realize, you know, how someone, how uh, a, a food animal is killed... You know, if it's if it's done in a humane manner, which there's an awful lot of countries around that that are a lot more humane than 
our slaughterhouses. And uh, of course, they don't go on mass production, but that's a whole other side, a uh, whole other thing. But if you stop and think of all of that fear and all of that fighting and all of that closeness and all of that craziness from being pinned in like that, and that just kind of it's ingrained in the meat or whatever the product is. And so when you consume that meat, I think it transfers to the individual as well. You know, you read these articles of someone got, got um, oh, an organ transplant from some serial killer or something, and then he went out and killed somebody. Probably not true, but still, to me, you know, if, the, if what's in the food can be passed on to the consumer, then why can't the... Uh, the vibration, the emotional vibration of those animals be pa passed on into the food as well. Just asking. So, back to this. He also began trumpeting a plan to shift his company from a grower and processor of meat to a producer, broadly, of proteins. And in May, the company became a seed investor in future meat technologies. An Israeli startup, oh boy, developing cultured meats from cells in petri dishes. Is this like the McShit Burger over in Japan? Is this where we're heading with this shit? Now, Tyson was also a major player in a recent investment round for Memphis Meats Inc. And a company in San Francisco developing lab-grown beef, poultry, and fish that's also funded by Bill Gates. See? Eureka! Go back and... In Eureka... I don't remember the name of it, but there was one of those where some, some, sci some really smart person with no common sense created, created chicken por parts as parts. And people started getting weird. Getting weird. <clears throat> Weird correlations. So, uh, da, 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 where was I at? Okay, and in December of last year, Tyson joined in a $55 million round of financing for a California-based startup, Beyond Meat Inc., which is the leading brand of plant-based protein products nationwide. Hmm. Tyson isn't the only player in the conventional meat industry making unconventional investments. Cargill Inc. bought into Memphis Meats too, as well as Purdue Farms, and is in, uh, investing in humane processing equipment. Slow growth chicken breeds, there you go, which is a niche organic brands, and even Hormel Foods Corp., uh, the maker of Spam, is developing animal free products. I didn't know Spam was meat. <laughs> so, if Tyson doesn't stay ahead of the game, it runs the very risk of falling behind. So, we want to actively disrupt ourselves, said Hayes. We don't want to be Kodak, which, yeah, sorry, sucks to be them. And he won't disclose how much money he's plowing into alter alternative proteins, but for now, it's far less than he's putting into status quo meat production. And the entire fund Hayes established for sustainable technology investment is $150 million. It's about half the cost of the poultry complex Tyson is building. But even his fiercest critics say that these investments are a worthwhile start. At the Discovery Center, Tyson's test cooks have been formulating protein bowls made from ingredients such as quinoa and lentils and chickpeas for the company's vegetarian brand Green Street and it's set to hit stores in 2019. Hayes points out a new refrigerated product that contains hard-boiled egg, a handful of almonds, and a few slices of cheese, the kind of meatle meatless snack you might see in the cold case at Whole Foods. But this one bears the Jimmy Dean logo. I really don't care for Jimmy Dean sausage. Just putting that out there. So wouldn't the carnivores or carniv yeah, carnivorous country crooning Mr. Dean be turning over in his grave at such a sight? No. Dean would understand that for a tradition steeped company such as Tyson, success over time means keeping a boot in the past 
but putting the other one in the future. And during the Great Depression, John Tyson had a one-man trucking company, and in 1935 he started transporting chickens to farmers in crates, bolted to the floor of his rattle-trap truck. He slowly built his own hatcheries and in 1958 entered the chicken processing business. And it was his son Don who led the company through 16 acquisitions and transformed a local Arkansas business into a poultry empire. Until Hayes. All but one of Don's five successors were educated at Southern colleges and elevated through the Tyson ranks. Now the new CEO is from Merrimack, New Hampshire, and graduated from Northwestern University's Kellogg School of Management, after which he spent 20 years in Chicago. And despite his urban urbanity, Hayes calls himself a small town boy who got his first job in the food industry at age 14. You know, that it's hard to get a job at 14 anymore if you want to earn a little bit of spending cash. Child labor laws and shit. You know, they... Th those are those were for a reason, but man, some of this shit is really becoming nanified. And apparently, he was washing dishes at a local restaurant, and uh, his grandfather tended a 200-acre potato farm in Vermont. 200-acre potato farm? Holy crap! That's a lot of spuds. And his dad, Warren, was an electrical engineer for Wang Laboratories which was an early manufacturer of desktop computers. Cool! So when Wang went bankrupt, Hayes Sr. founded a company that processed aluminum components for the c computing industry. Waking up before dawn every morning and working past dark, Hayes' mother Patricia helped run the company while raising three kids. Holy smokes! And then after college at the University of New Hampshire, he began a sales rep at a dairy giant, HP Foods, and then moved to sales position at ConAgra Foods and Kraft Foods before he became chief customer officer at Sara Lee. And the company at the time had both a bakery and meat division. And the latter split off to become Hillshire Farms in 2012. And as Hayes' affection for pork might suggest, his career hit its stride in the sausage sector, where he learned everything from hog farming logistics to how the sausage is made. Hmm. And he was eventually promoted to become Hillshire's chief supply chain officer. He just worked his way all the way up the ranks, didn't he? Now, Tyson's big pivot began in 2014 when it acquired Hillshire and Hayes. And that's when we began the transition from the operational based company to a branded company. That's from John Tyson who is the grandson of the company founder and current board chairman. So in other words, from a business centered on animal processing to one focused increasingly on direct-to-consumer brands. Now before the acquisition, Hayes had pushed for product diversification and helped develop so-called handheld breakfast items at Hillshire, including Jimmy Dean's Delight Sandwiches, which drove up the brand's frozen product sales by 25%. And John Tyson likes it. Hayes understands the way consumers think and what they want. It's an integral for our future. Now he adds that Tom is comfortable talking about the hard issues, and the company was facing a lot of hard issues when Tom stepped in. In May 2016, the anti-poverty organization Ox, or Oxfam International released a reported title, No Relief, exposing grim working conditions inside the poultry industry. It quoted 10 Tyson plant workers saying their managers had denied or reprimanded them for bathroom breaks. I had to wear pampers, read the headline in the Washington Post's Wonk blog about the report. And the same month, the advocacy group Mercy for Animals released videos showing farmers at Tyson chicken facilities kicking and stomping on chickens, and some of which appeared to have congenital deformities. So in September, 
New York-based food distributor Maplevale Farms brought a class action antitrust suit alleging that major poultry producers, including Tyson, had colluded to limit supply, drive up prices, and overcharge customers. Tyson has disputed these allegations along with the others against it. So, now on to November of 2016. In the immediate wake of all this, Tyson announced that Hayes would, or that Hayes would replace Donnie Smith, who'd served as CEO since 2009 and tripled the company's gross profit. Now, some analysts were up in arms. We are not at all happy to see Mr. Smith step down. His tenure has been the best period of Tyson's history. <laughs> and all of that shit was coming out. And that's the best of Tyson's history? Tyson's stock stagnated in the three months after Hayes took over, but it soon rallied by December, and by December was up 30%. Okay. Wait, let me see here. So, he took over in November. And it stagnated for three months after Hayes took over, but it rallied in December. December's only one month away from November. I'm confused. Hmm. Now, with trade disputes and an abundance of domestic supply have since hurt big U.S. meat producers, and in July, Tyson lowered its yearly profit forecast. Now, John Tyson insists that the CEO change had nothing to do with public relations challenges. But he also says, our name is on the door, and when people raise concerns about what we're doing enough, it becomes a little bit personal. So, 20 minutes from Springdale, Tyson's state-of-the-art hatchery produces 1.8 million chicks per week. Racks of eggs rotate slowly on on automated incubation trays as digital sensors monitor their temperatures. And behind a window uh, covered by a steel door, 40,000 newborn chicks sit on shallow plastic trays. They look cramped, but clean and dry, and some with tiny chips of eggshell clinging to their down. Tyson isn't directly involved in the raising livestock. Most of the hogs and cattle slaughtered at the plants are purchased at feedlots. By contrast, the company's chicken supply chain is vertically integrated, meaning Tyson owns the birds from birth. And I have seen some documentaries on that shit, and it's, it's the growers that take it in the ass when something goes wrong. Not Tyson. So, now the eggs are laid by hens at breeder farms and the chicks emerge at the company's hatcheries and the animals are then raised to process weight at contract farms using Feed Tyson supplies. That's the documentary I watched. And Hayes has endorsed a sort of an animal bill of rights that espouses freedom from hunger, thirst, discomfort, pain, injury, disease, fear, and distress and freedom to express normal behavior. Hayes acknowledges that these criteria aren't enough for many critics. Some people are going to hate what we do, and I appreciate that. It's what makes our country great. You don't have to buy our product. You don't have to believe it aligns with your ethos. But to the extent that the animals are under our care, we want to do the right thing, and we have lots of work to do. The animals should have only one bad day under our care. Hmm. And that's the day they become meat. I wonder if maybe they're switching to outside facilities or facilities to where they will actually be out and getting direct sunlight. Because, wow, some of those facilities, <clears throat> not cool. So, in his first month as, as CEO, Hayes, or Hayes brought many of Tyson's critics, including representatives from the World Resources Institute, World Wildlife Fund, the Humane Society, Oxfam, and the Poultry and Livestock Unions to Springdale to hear their concerns before he and his team crafted Tyson's sustainability goals. He later announced plans to improve conditions and safety measures for plant workers. 
in collaboration with Oxfam and United Foods Commercial Workers International Unions. He raised wages by a double-digit percentage over three years. And after the Mercy for Animals video, Tyson expanded its third-party monitoring program, which now tracks animals' health and evaluates human-animal interaction points using cameras installed in the company's chicken plants. Whitmore also hired a team of 53 full-time animal well-being specialists to train Tyson farmers in better animal care. So, customers can see that its birds are hardy and healthy. Whitmore is running live video on Facebook for some chicken farms. That's interesting. I don't know that I'd want to watch it, but it'd be cool to be able to peek in. Now, raising and slaughtering millions of chickens per year safely without antibiotics is both costly and logistically challenging. But Scott, who is a Tyson veterinarian who specializes in chick care, says much of the risk can be mitigated in the first hours of the chick's life with good nutrition, steady warmth, immune support, and absolute sterility. Tyson's poultry scientists revised the practices for hatcheries and feedlots, replacing antibiotics with probiotics and developing feed enhanced with, of all things, essential oils. Booyah! Booyah! I'm, I'm really going to have to look into this now. So, the antibiotic-free program added three cents to the cost of every pound of feed initially and a major investment for a company that churns out billions of pounds of feed per year. But Hayes calls a program a success because feed costs have come way down since the program began and less than 1% of chickens developed for Tyson brand products have succumbed to illness. And when that happens, they are treated with medication and sold without a Tyson brand label. Now, Prescott of the Humane Society questions Tyson's sustainability efforts. He says, I've seen very little progress in the company when it comes to changing its animal welfare policies or even basic measures to avoid the ab worst abuses that the animals in the supply chain suffer. And he says, Tyson's chickens grow too big too fast, which can cause heart failure and leg injuries. And the University of Arkansas did a study showing that if a human baby grew at the rate equivalent to these fast-growing chickens, it would be 660 pounds at the age of two months. Holy shite. Although, mm, I wonder how they gathered that information and how they came up with that number. And I like to see the numbers when they come up with something that outrageous. Even when they come up with something normal. I like to see the numbers. So, <clears throat> and it's widely cited in a 2013 study that assumes the baby was born weighing approximately 6.6 .6 pounds. Now, Tyson is also one of the only meat companies that doesn't have a policy for eliminating the use of gestation crates for hogs and metal cages only slightly larger than the animal's body that severely restrict movement. And Hayes apparently is staunch in his commitment to fast growth chickens, noting that many small org organic farmers raise these breeds too. And from a resources standpoint, it means growing the chicken with half the water, half the feed, half the environment impact. Where the pigs are concerned, Hayes insists that he's pushing to reduce the use of gestation crates, and he says that increases um, that increases production costs, and for now, there just isn't a critical mass of customers waiting to pay more for pork that's gestation crate free. So, this goes on quite a bit more. I really was surprised that it went on as long as it does. It really is quite a long article. <sighs> I will just go ahead and share it and let you guys finish reading it on your own. Although I do, I find it fascinating, but it's like, holy crap, I've really gone. Um, gone long on this. Police pulled Ingram over for a burnt out license plate light. Really? You know, they, they, mm, that's always the excuse. 
That's always the excuse. What was that? That was not what I... Let me see. Why does it say terms of service violation? That's weird. Hmm. Does that link work, Grimmy? Because that's, that's an odd... I have not violated any terms of service, and if I have, I wish I would have known I had done it. Hmm. Okay. Um... Well, it posted just find a world truth. That was just a weird fluke. You're messing with my wee little brain, girlfriend. Don't be doing that. Okay. Uh, let me see. I got a couple more that I wanted to get to, but let me go check out the pig real quick. So we can see what happened this date in history. Don't you know? Seeing as how I've only covered two articles so far. <laughs> Holy crap, they were long ones. They were long, they were windy. I was windy. I'm tired of reading. <laughs> okay, put over on PIGazette.com as I read. <laughs> Their uh, word of the day, day is male privilege wine. It's the go-to excuse that brand is brandished by nonads and their eunuchs whenever a woman is in the position of authority, fucks up so royally that she's fired. Yeah, okay. Um. Ah, okay. Thank you, guys. That really, I mean, I, my daughter used to work for Cargill. I mean, that's how she went to the UK. And she also worked in France for about a month. And she worked in Germany. And she came back to the United States. And then Cargill got weird. And then she got an offer by the company that bought the pork division of Cargill. And so now she's living out in Colorado. And she's a lot happier because that's where she wanted to be in the first place. So I found the meat thing kind of interesting. Just because I do have a child that's involved in that industry. And she does an awful lot of the number crunching. So I'm going to have to talk to her about that stuff later. Show her that article and say, hey, girlfriend. <laughs> She's one smart cookie. I have no idea where she gets it from. Must have skipped a year. <laughs> ah, my mom's smart too. Okay, in their quotable quote section. The weirder you're going to behave, the more normal you should look. It works in reverse, too. So when I see a kid with three or four rings in his nose, I know there is absolutely nothing extraordinary about that person. That's from PJ O'Rourke. Well, you know, when you gotta... I don't know. Book and a cover. Book and a cover. There's some of them where I just go, seriously, dude? You do realize what that's going to look like when you're like 70. Oh, you don't. Oh, okay. That's fine. You just carry on. Um, okay. Then they got shit about Trouble Stillskin on here. And I really could give two shits less about that. <sighs> trumples is Trumples. Um, boys, did you update? Yeah, it's... They got a lot of the same stuff in the... What is this? Uh, da -da -da -da. A loving husband. Ah, this one will tug at even the coldest of hearts. Thinking back a few years, living in Florida, I remember Hurricane Matthew, and I was ready for it, but my wife was not. When the wind reached a screaming pitch with the trees snapping and threshing, the horizontal streaming rain, Flying roofing iron and destroyed fences, as well as the unnerving sound levels, my wife was rooted to the spot. She stared and stared through the glass of the window, immovable, with her nose pressed to the window pane. 
The stark fear in her eyes will stay with me forever. Fortunately, as the eye of the storm arrived and the winds temporarily lessened, I felt personally safe enough to open the door and let her in. <laughs> Oh, I didn't see that one coming. <laughs> oh, Captain Assholio. Good job, dude. I wonder how yeah, he lived to write that, too. Wow. Okay. <laughs> I really did not see that one coming. Okay. <laughs> this date in history... The 17th of August, 1946, George Orwell publishes Animal Farm in the United Kingdom. I read that book, and that's just flat-ass messed up. This date in history, the 17th of August, 1953, first meeting of Narcotics Anonymous in Southern California. Great place to network and build new, meaningful dope connections. And finally, this date in history, the 7th of August, 1979, one of Porcus's all-time favorite flicks, Monty Python's Life of Brian premieres. Eh, I really wasn't all that impressed with Life of Brian. It was okay, but yeah. Hmm. I kind of like, hmm. Wasn't impressed with the Life of Brian. We'll just leave it at that. It's okay. It had its moments. But other than that, it's like, okay, whatever. Okay. Now. Let's go check out this one. This one I wanted to get to. Just because. <clears throat> well, you know, I read about Tyson. <laughs> and I needed a, a quick swig of my beverage. Um. You know, dealing with corporate America and all that other fun stuff. I thought this were, would be rather appropriate. So, you want to know if someone is trustworthy? Look for these 15 signs. And if a, per a person demonstrates these cues and traits, they're keepers. Oh, so. Um... Great relationships give life significantly more purpose and uh, in business they translate to resources, advice, and stability. Trust is at the heart of these connections. Would you go away, you stupid video thing? Ah. In any case, so the 15 signs that are dead giveaways that you're dealing with a keeper. Number one, they are consistent. A trustworthy person will use roughly the same behavior and language in any situation. They have the self-control to maintain character and follow through on what they say they'll do, even when they are tempted to walk it back. They won't wear different masks or pretend that they're someone that they're just or that they're not just to impress and switching gears comes from having learned reliable new information not from self-serving whims so what's more what they say matches what you hear from others number two they show compassion and humility both of these traits demonstrate that the person can think of others well and doesn't consider themselves to be more important than anyone else we really are. All, I, there ain't nobody that's more. I mean, personally, you should be the most important person, period. Because if you can't take care of yourself, then there ain't no way you're going to take care of anyone else. So you should be numero uno. You should be most important. But then everybody else is just right in there with you. And they should all be thinking that they are the most important as well. So, you know, it's all. Everybody thinks they're the most important person one. So, whatever. Now, because they are more outwardly focused, they're less likely to step on your toes or betray you to get something that they need or want. Oh, I know some people that have done that kind of shit. Not the, not the nice part, the stepped on toes and betrayed. Number three, they respect boundaries. 
Trustworthy individuals don't try to impose their will on others because they don't feel the need to control those around them. They avoid bullying and acknowledge that no means no. And you know what? Um, what is it? Power is the ability to cro control others. Strength is the ability to control yourself. I read that somewhere. Number four, they compromise and don't expect something for nothing. Small sacrifices show that the individual recognizes that trust is a two-way street. They're willing to give a little to get something back later. And if they do ask for something, they're sure to demonstrate the value of their request. Number five, they're relaxed, and so are you. A person who is faking it and who is more likely to behave in shady ways usually will display some signs of anxiety, such as agitated body language. Now, if the person seems at ease, they likely have nothing to hide and are being honest and open with you, unless they're a psychopath. I just had to throw that in there. Um, you'll likely feel calm too because you won't be subconsciously picking up on and mirroring back negative cues. Number six, they are respectful when it comes to time. Trustworthy people do their best not to be late or cancel plans at the last minute because they know that doing so inconveniences you and violates promises. They won't try to rush or drag things out for their own benefit either. Hmm. They also realize that your time is just as valuable as their time is, which is something that a lot of doctor's offices don't do. <laughs> I understand emergencies come up, but good God, you've got a receptionist department. Can't the receptionist call and say, oh, we had an emergency come up if we can reschedule? No, they're not good at that. Uh, number seven, they show gratitude. Yes, I see Flasher coming on. Uh, okay, true, Sock, true. I didn't say I didn't like Life of Brian Grammy, but I just, it's not my favorite Monty Python. I like, I prefer the search for the Holy Grail myself, <laughs> but, eh. um, let's see. Number seven, they show gratitude. Trustworthy individuals are willing to admit that they can't do it all alone and value teamwork. They give credit where it is due, even if it means that they don't advance as quickly or shine as much themselves. Number eight. They give up all the facts, even if it hurts. Truth and transparency matters to trustworthy people. And they won't lie by omission or fudge data. They will give up even the information that could put their reputation at risk or create conflict, believing that those conflicts can be solved with good empathy and communication. And, you know, if you just get it all out. It's like ripping off a band-aid. Just tend to it. Just do it. Just do it. Besides, if you fib or you hold stuff back, then that's just one more thing you got to remember and you, you'll get stuck on later. Nah, it's just not worth it. Just, just spit it out. Get it over with. Number nine, they confide in you. Confiding in someone, exposing faults and all, involves a certain amount of vulnerability. So when someone confides in you, it demonstrates that the individual already trusts you and that they want you to be open with them too. Number 10, they, are materialistic, they aren't materialistic or desperate for money. So while there's zero wrong with having nice things, trustworthy people don't put stuff ahead of people. They're willing to give up what they have or could have to help. Financial stability facilitates trust because it reduces the temptation to treat, treat others poorly out of the need of self-preservation. Number 11. They're right a lot. Really? 
because trustworthy people value truth, they are willing to do their homework and they do the research that leads to verifiable conclusions so they have a track record of having the right answer. Number 12. They skip the water cooler gossip. Oh God. That I never damn. Yeah. I, and you know I go to town and people go, did you hear about? No. I live out in the boonies. I really don't care. <laughs> and I don't. It's like if you don't come mess with me it's and you're not hurting anybody else. Eh. Not my business. So, trustworthy individuals don't like to make assumptions about anything or anybody. And they prefer to get information from the source and to let the source speak for themselves. They avoid rumors because they know that rumors usually include negativity that tears people down instead of building them up. And when they do talk, their language is empowering and respectful. Now, I do have to admit, because this just popped into my head when talking about rumors and negativity, that while I was going through my divorce and, and that year afterwards, oh my Lord, I heard more rumors about me. And every time I heard one, I'd zippity doo -dah it up just a little bit because I figured, what the hell, y'all think I'm having a hell of a good time here, so I may as well add to it a little bit. That way, at least in your mind, I'm just having a damn good time. <laughs> They didn't need to know what the, was going on. And you know, if they want to spread that shit, hey, I'll, I'll color in the lines. What the hell? <laughs> it's about me anyway, so fuck it. If I want to expand on it, I will. Number 13, they're learners. Individuals who were worth your trust know that they don't have all the answers. They look for ways to learn and improve themselves constantly. And through that process, they're willing to share the resources and facts that they find. Number 14. You know who they're connected to and they try to connect you. Hmm. Now both these elements show that the other person sees you as important. And they want you to be part of their regular social group and meet the people that you need to succeed. Others can affirm or contradict what you know about the individual too. And subsequently, more pe uh, the more people the individual introduces you to, the more likely it is that they're not hiding who they are. Yes, I got a flasher going on. Yeah, it is kind of, but yeah. Yeah, sock puppet. Okay, and lastly, hey, this was published May of 2018, by the way. That's on the bottom of it. <laughs> so lastly, number 15, they're there for you and others. Trustworthy people will listen to and support you even when they don't need something from you. They do their best to be available to help whatever you might be going through. And you know, I really have been blessed to have an awful lot of of very trustworthy people in my life. I have been around some. I've been, I should say, I have been blessed to be around some that are not so trustworthy, but they were excellent examples of what not trustworthy <laughs> looks like. So I knew what to look for. Um, oh, well, thank you, Rob Works. I'm going to have to go there. That looks fun. Okay, let me put this trustworthy one. As if abolishing ICE was radical enough. Democrats are now calling for abolishing prisons. You know, if you took most of the... Did you know that Colorado closed one of its prisons? The one at Burlington is closed. Because... Stop it. Stop it, world truth. Okay. If you're going to be a poo-poo head. There.
Now, I'm going to check out that one that Rob just shared. Thank you, Rob. From wakingtimes.com. I hope I have... This doesn't look like it's a too awful long one. I, I really have picked a couple of doozies, haven't I, tonight? <laughs> so, the three trigger terms being used to stop critical thinking. Triggered. I thought trigger was a horse. <clears throat> so... It's a strange world of newspeak that we live in. What was once a society devoted to logic and progress is now being herded in echo chambers of thought control and anti-critical thinking. Really? When was it a society devoted to logic and progress? That, I, that's just my first question. So without the ability to examine an issue impartially and completely, there is little hope of maintaining liberty and freedom as history repeatedly demonstrated, which is once again why, why I asked, when were we a society devoted to logic and progress? So today we find that thinking is a diminishing art. And in its place, sound bites and stop thought terms are used to put the brakes on the mind. These terms are widely used as signals to prevent minds from looking too deeply into a topic. Thinking critically means making reasoned judgments that are logical and well thought out. It is a way of thinking in which one doesn't simply accept all arguments and conclusions to which one is exposed without questioning the arguments and conclusions. It requires curiosity, skepticism, and humility. People who use critical thinking are the ones who say things such as, How do you know that? Is this conclusion based on evidence or gut feelings? And are there alternative possibilities when given new pieces of information? Yes. I'm quite the doozer. <laughs> Is that a doozer or a dozer? <laughs> I let's see. Okay, back to this. So the three terms most widely used today to this avail to de is detailed below. So ooh, ooh, I love this first one. This one's me. I need a shirt. I need to talk to my youngest daughter. She's making t shirts now. Did I tell you that? She has her own business, willy-nilly. Love it. Um, actually, one of the t-shirts she gave, gave me is, oh, I'll just have to, I'll have to put it on and take a picture and post it sometime. <laughs> In any case, number one is conspiracy theorist. Booyah, that's me. Although sometimes I'm a conspiracy factualist too because I do have my ducks in a row. But a lot of times it's just theory. What if? So, this term is so overused that it really is devoid of any practical meaning. And if you were to examine it at face value, it describes a person who is looking to understand injustices in our world and is willing to look at uncomfortable facts in search of negative influence, of which there is plenty in our world today. However... Conspiracy theorist has literally become a derogatory term that is attributed to anyone who refuses to accept the corporate lame ass propaganda systems, I mean mainstream narrative, at face value. It doesn't matter that there is overwhelming evidence indicating that the corporate lame ass propaganda system does not value objectivity, objectivity or report on important issues thoroughly or truthfully. Now we find this term applied as a prefix to the well-known journalists and media personalities almost as we use the term doctor. And it's an adjective that precedes them everywhere. So that before you even know what issue is being discussed, you know that the issue is coming from someone considered to be fringe or unacceptable. Number two, alt. I thought control alt delete was the ultimate. It's like, what the hell's going on? Control alt delete. <laughs> Apparently, when we see the label alt being applied more and more frequently as an ob 
adjective or adjective for sentiment that supposedly do not fit in with the accepted status quo. Ideas outside of the box. Step outside that litter box. Really, it smells nicer and you don't get all those little crumplies all over your feet. You know, the alt-media and the alt-right and the alt-left and the alt-news and the alt-health and on and on and on and on. And the signal here is that the corporate lame-ass propaganda system or the mainstream is the safe space. Come into the safe space. It's comfortable here. You don't have to think about anything. And that, any segment of ideas or thought given this prefix, is outside of the mainstream. And therefore, not something ordinary people would want to associate with. Am I doing a really kind of weird uh, Glenda the Good Witch and uh, Captain Kirk thing? It almost feels like it. <laughs> Whoa. So, it takes complex ideas and sensitive issues and benches them. So, that when the hive mind stumbles upon something, alt they immediately react with fear, disdain, and feigned outrage. I am outraged, so you are outside of range. Rage, so you are not angry. Outrage, outside of rage, so you're not angry. Okay, cool. I know that's not what it means. So, there is no alt in our world. We are one. And any faction of ideas is really just a spin-off of a shared reality that we all live in. If segments of this shared space are off limits and labeled as so, we all lose. And finally, number three, hate speech. That's hate speech. Really? I didn't use that word at all in that diatribe that I went through until just now. This term is one of the all-time favorite of politicians and tyrants. After all, what could be more dangerous than hate? I hate you. You tie your shoes weird. You know, that's preschool kind of shit. Oh, wait, no. They don't tie shoes anymore, do they? Newsflash! Hate speech is not the same thing as a hate crime. And really, if you commit a crime in anger, I'm thinking that's pretty much a hate crime. Doesn't make a shit and bit of difference who you done it to. If you did it in anger or in envy... Oh, well. Speech that is just that. It's speech. And it's literally vibrating air moving through space. And unless we're talking about the LRAD crowd control cannon, sound really can't cause people physical harm. Well, there's other vibrational things that... And there's my conspiracy theory. Tinfoil hat's getting a little tight here. It is fascinating to watch how people use this term so freely, as if speech itself can be criminal. American society is founded on the idea of freedom of speech and expression, which at its core is the recognition that as human beings, we do not and never will all see the world in the same way. It is an acknowledgement of the fact that different people have different ideas about how the world is and should be. That these differences shouldn't be used as a basis for discrimination. And the term hate speech is one of the most loaded and ambiguous terms in the political lexicon. So beware. And I think right up behind that is racist. Man, that gets whipped out an awful lot. Now, in the final thoughts, next time you see or hear these terms being used, ask yourself, what is it about the story that you're not supposed to think too deeply about? Allow both sides of the argument to share equal time in your mind and honor the independent, sovereign being within yourself that deserves a chance to make up its own mind about how it wishes to view the world. Excellent choice there, Rob Works. Excellent. I like that. I'm going to have to share that on multiple places. Good job, old bean. Good job.
Okay. Let's see. I actually have to type things over here on World Truth. It's it's maddening. <laughs> I can't just hey. I can't just, you know, do like little emoticons like I could over on Freedom's Network. Cause Grimmy had me spoiled rotten. Thank you, Grimmy, for spoiling me rotten. Okay. Egad. And Oops. There. Egad and Gadzooks. Thank you once again, Robworks, for that one. That was bonus round. Okay, let's see. Dang, it's getting close to the end. Uh, e I E I O. And on this farm, he said, "Okay, hams, duck, pork, chicken. You bitch. What you guys talk? What y'all talking about? I see raccoon has joined and then got kicked. Was raccoon going through the damn thing again? The trash can. Who are you describing as batshit crazy? I think I resemble that." Um. Who the hell? Thomas Paine. Huh? Oh, Alyssa Milano. Oh. Oh, and they're attacking Nancy Pelosi because they're absolutely terrified. Uh, no, I'd... Woo, you, that's what I need to do. Because I think I have another mouse. In my house. I think I do. And maybe if I go and buy a couple of pictures of Nancy Pelosi and like... um, Well, yeah, Graham, I am already rotten. But um, if I buy some pictures of Nancy Pelosi and, and you know, like hide them behind like my stove and under my cabinets, you know, in places where I have heard little noises that I should not be hearing. Do you think maybe that would scare the little Mises so bad that they would just die? Because <laughs> I hate mousetraps. I really do. And that's, I have to, as soon as I get done here, I actually have to run into town. Because I didn't have time earlier today. Because it's busy. But I got to go into town and get some of those sticky mousetrap thingies. Not the ones that come smack down. Because I wind up smacking down on my fingers. And then my fingers get all puffy. It's not good. <laughs> so I'll do the sticky thing. Because those work. Although they're, duh. But I'll put a few of those out and see if maybe I can catch, if I have a little scurrier, see if I can catch it. So, in any case, hey, guess what? Y'all been listening to Grammy's Rocket Cheer here on a Freaker Friday. Thank you ever so much for listening and putting up with me and playing along. And yeah, I know those first two articles were like dumb hangers and humdingers all rolled into one. They was long ass buggers. But uh, I found them interesting, which is why I kept going. Mm hmm. And there was a couple other ones that I I kind of sort of like too. But hey, and Rob works. Booyah! Bonus points. Bonus points. So be sure to stick around because later on this evening, Grimner will be here with balls to the wall, man. <laughs> so um, don't go anywhere because it's Friday. It's the weekend. Kick back, Max. Relax. Trust me. I will be doing enough for all y'all while I'm helping my mom because if you think I'm a squirrel yeah <laughs> I come by it honestly so my mother is kind of squirrely too but you know she's got reason to be she's 87 now okay you know what I think I have time for one little perusal over on Oopie let's go check out Oopie shall we because I have two minutes two minutes if Oopie will come up fast I want to see what's keep families together. Mm. Oh, to improve children's diets, conserve forests. Wow. Thank you guys for listening and playing. I really do appreciate all of you. I, you know, there's lots of times when I think, wow, really? You guys put up with my goofiness? And I appreciate it. I really do. Um, okay, you know what? I'm not seeing it. Ooh, a crocodile. Crocodile's motorboat attack. Dude. I'll just, I tell you what. I'll just share this page over here. Because there's all kinds of way cool headlines. Over in the odd part. 
bonus points. <laughs> Oh, well, I think I'm going to get the heck out of here. So y'all have an absolutely amazing evening. Um, do you want to get some, do you get some nookie, uh, uh, a cookie? I, I tell you what, I just, this afternoon, I filled three of those gallon Ziploc bags with shredded zucchini. Six zucchini did that. I got big zucchini. <laughs> oh, well. And I got lots more out in the garden. But that means zucchini muffins and zucchini bread and zucchini cake. And, ooh, I don't know. I might wait till it gets cooler and I start baking. In any case, y'all have an absolutely amazing evening and an awesome weekend. Um, also, tomorrow at noon Eastern Time, Flash a Rooney Dork and Vinny Dork are going to be on with the Dork Table. Noon Eastern Time on Sunday, Grimner going to jump in playing the blues. Rousing game of trivia going on in the RLM chat. I'll miss out because I'll be with Mom. Right after Grimmy will be Hal Anthony who's going to open up a can of whoop ass on yo ass behind the woodshed. So all kinds of stuff going on this weekend. I will be back Wednesday for the Wackadoodle Wednesday edition. But until then, please remember... I really do love you all, and I wish you all enough. Good night.